um, image and she gave an energy to talk about more mm. aliasing and, and, um, and these humans okay. that are good to go, so, yeah. So it's all, all in one. Mm. Okay, welcome to the Thomas Electron Microscopy Center's Winter EM course. A uh, couple announcements. The first recitation will be Wednesday. We won't be recording the recitation. The expectation is you come on site. In terms of workshops, I know a few of you asked about Appian workshops. Hopefully, you were passing information. If not, you can see me after the class. So, Appian Part One is not this, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. That's January 29th, I believe. Um, Appian Part Two will be March 8th. So those two modules will be covering uh, single particle data processing. Appian part three, which covers tomography, occurs March 29th. And uh, we talked briefly about that during the sample prep gold grids. A lot of people are backward with gold grids. We will have a gold grid making workshop February 14th. And there are links to register. If you don't know those links, you can see me after, or send us an email and we'll forward you those. Okay, any other questions for that? Okay, so today we're going to uh, be rounding out our fundamental section. And this is a very important section. It'll be a little bit more conceptual today, but the idea is that after this month, a lot of what you'll see and hear about in the later part of the workshop already assumes that you have a certain basic, like you know what an FFT is, you know about a microscope, you know, especially very topical, image formation, the CTF, and other effects. And this is really important because um, although we're gonna go over it conceptually, if you have any in-depth questions or anything's unclear, this is a very good form to bring that up. And we'll try to uh, get you on a good foundation such that when, you know, let's say the next lecturer comes to talk about, you know, back projection and other things like that, you, want, you start to understand the concepts, you start to understand not only the image, but what is required to produce that image, or what we consider an image. Okay, so today is being team taught by two very talented people. Yangzi is also doubles as your TA, but he's a grad student at, that's shared between Filippo Mancia and as well as here at SEMSI. And I believe he's the most versed at not only programming, installing, but pr processing and purifying protein. And he can do that all in a day, mm -hmm. quite surprisingly. And a senior scientist, Anchi Chen, and uh, many of you will go to the Appian workshop and many of you have used Legendon that uh, has used the facility. She's the main curator and, and the main force at making sure we have standards, making sure we have stable releases and that things aren't just falling apart. So without further ado, I'll turn you over to Yangzi. Is anything working? Hello. Okay, so today I'll be um, teaching both like Fourier, um, a wide branch of the lecture flow of Fourier transforms and image formation. So um, we will not be going through directly what was taught in the, I hope you guys went through the, the lectures because they actually were really very helpful in a lot of touching on the basic concepts of how like the CTF was formed and how you look at a 1D, 2D, and 3D Fourier transforms. Instead, of what we're doing will be building on what Grant Jensen has mentioned and we'll be tying back to some of the things here. Yes, said, and then building on of that onto more like practical aspects of what you actually would see when you do um, imaging in cryo EM. Okay, so for me, I'll be touching first on um, image formation directly. So this is the concept which Grant Jensen went through in his lectures: amplitude and can't see the top there. Okay, amplitude and phase contrast scattering, um, wave propagation and phase shifts. The contrast transfer function that is actually will what I will feature heavily in what I'll be teaching. Um, the focus and defects, envelopes and envelope functions, and correction on CTF. Okay, so um, image formation itself in, in electron microscopy has quite many modalities. Um, Grant has briefly touched on it in his, um, uh, in his talk, and I find it really nice that to, to see that actually when you put an electron through your sample, there are many, many things that can be emitted and actually observed. And what we are doing in transmission electron microscopy was pretty single particle. It's only touching a, just one aspect of the of the emissions that come out from observing your sample. And you can also do many things like transmission, scanning, color, reflection, and even like you mentioned, like even the voltage, the conductance of the electrons flowing in, you can um, you can observe that and, and 
use that to, to uh, determine what's in our sample. So that's pretty cool. But for, for our workshop, we'll just be um, focusing on TM for query. And so the transmission part, as you can see, and the electrons will just go right through. OK. Yeah, so this will be kind of the main focus because a lot of the things that um, I like be focused and all these will actually tie back into how the contrast process function changes um, with, with all these effects. Um, so having an idea of how the contrast process function works allows you to understand um, the basis of image formation. Um, so and in Grant's lecture, he, he made it very clear that when um, how it actually functions and that when you have electrons going straight through, that's the, the phase is not shifted up, but as you move outwards and outwards, because you have um, they, they get kind of scattered, the electrons get scattered more because they, they are detecting higher spatial frequency information. Um, then you have difference in phase shift, which will result in this um, difference in contrast as you um, as you touch on the image plane itself. So this difference in kind of phase becomes a difference in contrast and results in the contrast transfer function of your microscope. Um, um, this yeah, so this is a very important concept, and, and instead I will not go through again what Grant Jensen has taught, but if you're not going to lectures, please um, go through and read it again. What I will go through actually is just uh, to, to show you straight on the, the equation itself. You don't have to, of course, memorize it, but um, what we'll go through will be different effects of, um, of how we image our, our samples and how this relates to the contrast function function itself, and you can see that actually the, the math actually holds. Um, how you change something actually reflects um, nicely on, on the map behind. Um, so for this case, you can see the CTF as a kind of sine function that has um, a, a bunch of different variables inside. Um, there's the, the kind of new spatial frequency defocus is there. There's also spherical aberration coefficient. Um, that is actually a, a, a property of the microscope itself, so it's kind of fixed, so you don't really change it. And then you have your electron wavelength. So a few variables go in, and then if you have if you know all these, you put it in your crunch, you get a CTF. And let me show you now that there's actually software that can um, simulate a CTF function. And then you can use it to play and understand how these different variables um, um, go um, interplay with each other. So this is, let's see. Okay. So this software is actually from Eman. It's called CTF Fit. Um, I launched it from the command line. Um, I think there are other programs such as Spider or these actually um, that actually have the same similar concept. So the idea is that I can do a simulation of a CTF, and then this is actually the curve that comes out. Um, so let me put in kind of a typical value for high-end microscope, the Creos microscope, which has 3,000 kilo electron volts coming from the FEG, and then the CS for the cam uh, for the microscope is 2.7, and then let's say we collect the typical for of the Kuyas one point, that, that's a pixel size. How many angstroms are there in a pixel? And the amplitude contrast, because we, uh, the amplitude contrast is actually the contrast between your sample and your background, and that is actually um, on for biological EM, we, the protein and the versus the water is pretty close. You, you both have hydrogen and oxygen. And so the amplitude contrast is pretty low. It's around 0 0.07, so I'll put that here. And then when I do that, and I start to stretch it. What do I see anything? You should see something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually what you see if you change the defocus. So as Grant has mentioned, this is the on on the axis. This is the intensity, so so called the contrast. And then the one away. This is your um. As you go space, is your spatial frequency. As you go along here, you get um, higher spatial frequency, and here slower. And as I move my defocus value from a low value to a high defocus, you can see that you get many, many more kind of oscillations of a CTF. Yeah. So just be familiar with that. You have a higher defocus, you get more oscillations. So back to the PowerPoint itself. <coughs> So the one property I'm going to touch on first will be with respect to the defocus in that you have low versus high defocus. So when I play around just now, you can see that when I move to a higher defocus, I get more oscillations. And what does that mean when you look at your micrograph, for instance? So here we have a negative stain um, kind of samples, um, ribosomes actually, that go from 
pretty close to focus values all the way up to a pretty high um, defocus. Um, you can see here that this, this is in reciprocal space, the fast Fourier transform of this image. And what you actually see here, um, as mentioned as well in Grant's lectures, is um, you can see things like tone rings. So these rings are actually the 2D representations of, um, of your kind of contrast transfer functions that you can map up onto it. So here at close to focus, you don't actually see any of the rings. Um, but when you go further and further from focus, you can see you get more rings and, and the rings become closer to the center as the same as we saw when we do a simulated CTF. Um, with further from focus, you get more rings. This, um, this is a negative stain sample, so even at close to focus, you can still see your particles because the, of, the, of the stain itself. Um, but when you go to cryo, which um, many of you definitely would like to do for high, pushing high resolution um, imaging, you will actually, um, this, is, this is directly from Grant Jensen's slides itself, that you don't really see these viruses anymore. They become really hard to see. Um, and the reason why is because that you, um, you don't get that many oscillations at the lower spatial frequencies, which can represent things like the edge of your virus, as well as, um, as, well as the, the more kind of larger features that allow you to, to, distinguish, um, uh, to, dis to distinguish your virus from the surrounding water. With more oscillations, and then you go up um, down black and white, you can actually see these things more clearly. Um, but, uh, but of course, that the, it comes at a cost because there's a scrambling of higher spatial frequency information, which I'll touch on afterwards. Um, this one is also, uh, um, this other thing is also the same thing as what um, Grant Jensen mentions. This is from Ifan's paper. Um, that you can see close to focus, you can hardly see the particles that, that are here. And then when you go a bit far from focus, you, um, you actually see them much nicer, these black particles. And then this is the corresponding CTF. Now, the nice thing is that he has put them, overlaid them on top of each other. And you can see that you have, a, for example, at this spatial frequency, you, you get one up, you get, you get more oscillations, and you only get one, one peak over here compared to two already for the higher defocus. So you can think about it that you get more, um, you, you get to see this, inf uh, this, uh, this information, this information, like at, at, at a contrast of one. Um, as compared to just having this spatial frequency information at a contrast of one. So you definitely see more details for the higher end focus. Yeah, so this is the first concept I'd like to reiterate that the reason why we defocus in a microscope is that normally you don't see your particles if you don't defocus it um, in, uh, in, in cryo EM. You need to put some defocus to see it and do things with it like pick them because you can't see your particles you can't do anything with them. Okay, the next concept to bring across with um, defocus values will be defocus and particle box size. Um, so what you see here, this is a slide from Chris Russo, um, in, in that these are actually gold beads uh, imaged um, in uh, with uh, with cryo TEM, and you can see all these little dots here. Um, if you remember from Grant Jensen's lectures, these dots are actually kind of like um, fringes of the of of the gold gold beads as you. Um, put up the defocus. So um, the more defocus you apply, the more the fringes will stretch out. And what these kind of fringes represent is the kind of delocalization of information of um, found on that go bead that uh, of, of the structure itself um, that gets spread out in in real space because of your defocus. So at focus, you have the minimal, you have minimized that. But the further uh, uh, defo uh, higher defocus you go, the further fringes go out. And if you have another effect is that if you see, if I, for example, I cut out the particle and I box it out, and I box out only cutting out some of the parts that are that the fringes we see, you actually lose that information, um, and then you cannot take it back once you do reconstructions. So the higher the focus you go means that you actually need a bigger box size because information of a particle gets spread out um, spatially. So that's another thing you have to worry about when you have a high defocus value. Um, yeah, this, and this table from Pavel's paper actually shows you how at different kind of a, a different defocus, you will need different window sizes to achieve kind of to make sure you are not losing any information. So one it means that you are sampling the, the um, up to the Nyquist, so you are not losing anything. So any fraction of that is bad. Um, so if you have a very small window size and you have a very high defocus, you can see that you you only have um, ten percent of of information you have. 
and then here you have 70% but still you don't get everything. <coughs> so but if you go closer to the focus, you actually make sure that you don't lose any information um, after the night quiz. <coughs> okay, so this is the second concept I'll touch on um, with the focus. Any questions so far? Okay, the third concept is that the focus is, has a bit of an isotropy in that it's not always circular. So uh, I think a lot of slides scrunch show that it's a nice and circular ring, but actually there, there can be a problem that your know, defocus is not the same in the x and y axis. Um, and you can see here the tone rings here, this one is a nice circular one, but you can have a case where you have an oval shaped elliptical um, tone ring, meaning that the defocus, for example, on this axis is much less uh, than this axis. And that can be a problem because you, you know, if you see it, it, uh, these particles, they seem to be a bit smeared in one axis. And uh, the worst, the astigmatism, uh, this effect is called astigmatism. Um, then the worst uh, uh, disrupted your image is. And this can be fixed using um, objective stigmators. If you remember, you have your, your objective lens and below that the stigmators. If you adjust them, you can fix the, the difference in electromagnetic current in your lenses such that they are more they are equal all around so that you will reduce the effect of um, um, astigmatism over here. And it can also be corrected post hoc using software if it's not so serious. Yeah, so this is another thing that the focus values can vary in the x and y direction. And given that it can vary in the x and y direction, it can also actually vary in the z direction. So this is a tomogram actually of a of, um, of a single particle um, image that is actually, this is, um, look at, what's GDH? GDH is frozen on a grid, and these are individual particles. So, what you see is a tomogram. So, when you saw the image, this will actually slice through the tomogram, and you can see the individual dots here. They represent um, GDH. So, I'll play it through. So, as you cut along, you can see these all these dots, they are GDH black dots and you go up and then maybe and then some of them form like columns in the middle this is the vitreous ice and then you go all the way up you get another layer and see a lot of black dots again so i'll just play it once through again so the idea is that all these particles even though you think they are one they are they lie on a flat plane they are actually not in, in, the, in the, the ice can have a specific amount of thickness and the particles can be oriented in the ice in like the top layer and the bottom layer and as well as the middle. Although this is more atypical, there are, there are definitely particles that form a single layer uh, in the in vitreous ice. There, can be case, there are cases like that which the particles form two layers. And what actually that means is that you particles on the top and the bottom, they have a different kind of what we call a Z height, height in the Z axis. And when you try to take a defocus value on, on this, what you're getting is just the average defocus value across the whole z-axis. So, so it will only applicable maybe for particles in the middle because that's the average. Particles on the top and the bottom will have a slightly different defocus um, as compared to uh, the particles that are in the, in the middle. And therefore, with a, you can have a defocus gradient. And that gradient can actually limit your resolution as well and, and the deleterious. Uh, but it can also be corrected if you try to do localized defocus refinement and estimation. Okay. Okay, so the next thing will be like um, when you set a defocus, I'm not sure how many of you have been on a, you, I remember most of, a lot of you haven't been on a microscope yet, but um, who are the ones who have been on a microscope already? Okay. So for those on the microscope, um, where you have collected and you set a defocus, right? So what values do you typically use? 2.5 to 2.5 microns. Is it, is it a negative value? Or, yeah, it's negative. Why is it a negative value? Um, I have no idea. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you know? Does it have to do with the crossover? Um, not, not really, but... Yeah, it's not really a crossover, but about that. Yeah, there are differences between the positive and negative that um, has to do with the equation itself, actually. Yeah. So with the equation, if you look at the equation more carefully, and this actually, and, and she enlightened me quite recently about it, is that there's actually a minus sign over here. So your defocus value is over here. 
So this is the contrast transfer function. So if you want to maximize contrast in your image, um, what will you do? You will try to make sure that this value adds up to the highest value right, for a sine function. And to do so, you, um, you de then you want to make the defocus a negative value. So when you multiply minus 1 by minus 1, you get a positive value. So these two things will add up in an additive way. That's kind of the reason why you keep to a negative defocus value. What does that, what does that sure. mean? Yeah, zero. So, like yeah. So on, on a microscope, so it's it's based. This is kind of settings based on the actually the, the microscope itself. So if you turn down the power of the objective, um, they will be considered negative value. So the lenses become weaker, and then your focus goes down. But if you go, if you turn up the power of the of the objective, um, then the value will become positive. So it's it's a respect of the, the microscope itself. Am I right, Angie? Yeah. yeah. So So if you make this thing positive, you get a slightly more a better kind of a contrast um, at a certain facial frequencies uh, with the negative value. So yeah. the way the way that it's it's been done at the very beginning is that when you start to say I want to have um, I want to use the focus to increase my contrast, so you will ask what would be if I use the same value differences from zero. So for people who are not clear about how actually it looks like uh, under focus versus over focus, that's a nice image to get show that. So when you take a particle under focus, I think it's a hypocritical movie, and then you actually see you these black particles on a, on white, kind of black on white. But when and this corresponds to the the red color curve. But when you do an over focus, you can see that the the contrast now kind of flips. Then you get something like white in color. The, everything become that was black becomes white. And that's because the under over focus curve is almost kind of like a flip of the under focus curve. But if you look carefully, this is not actually a direct flip because of the fact that we have this uh, minus sign here. So, um, so the if you have uh, under focus, you can see that the, the value here is actually um, not zero. This is actually off offset from zero. And what this means is that you have um, you do have a more a, a stronger absolute um, contrast. Um, value if you have a negative, um, if you have uh, under focus compared to over focus. So you can see it doesn't start from zero, this is starts from minus you know, 0.1 or something and it goes here and it goes back down and so on and so forth. And therefore the, the red curve is, is slightly um, superior in the amount of contrast you can give as compared to the, the blue curve and therefore you don't use it. of contrast between this part and this part, right? So our eyes sees this part as a change of contrast. That makes it look very weird. So for a lot of people are over focus image, it looks very weird because it no longer has the same sign in your contrast as the rest of the frequency, which it looks like more like your density. So that's that's the differences between one that you see. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So for me, initially, when I thought why you um, you had to do a negative defocus was because yeah, it looked white color looks kind of a bit weird. So that was the first reason I thought. But actually, there is a more better mathematical reason. 
uh, behind it. Okay, so under focus is used because it gives slightly more contrast based on the CPF equation. And next, this is uh, this was also touched on by um, uh, by Grant, and that in when you have a CTF, you have you definitely have zero crossings um, in your equation over here. So if you have a single, just a single CTF, it will be hard to do. Um, these points will be lost forever because they are zeros, so you don't get any transfer information, and if um, and that will result in loss in spatial frequency information in your structure. In order to kind of compensate for that people and especially for single particle imaging where you can combine many particles when you do your reconstruction what they do is that they take a bunch of different defocus a range of defocus um, and then this will um, all the zeros will be at different places and therefore the zeros will be filled up by the like the, the ones of this curve that will be filled up the zero of this curve and so on and so forth so they compensate for each other and make sure that you fill up um, the spatial frequency pretty well so that's why I think as uh, the student mentioned that we he took a defocus range of I think 1.5, 2.5. Yeah, this is the reason. Okay. Okay, so this is the kind of the effect of the defocus, this delta f over here. So now the other the other kind of uh, variables as well as our CTF equation, and now we'll touch on them. Um, the first one is actually electron wavelength. So this this lambda over here in many parts. So the electron wavelength actually depends um, on your on the on the, the power of your electron gun, the, how many kV your your electron source is. And for 120, you can see the values. You can there's an equation to calculate to from kV to calculate how much electron wavelength. Um, but the idea is that the higher your your um, kV, the, the the smaller your wavelength, but the electron goes much faster. And how this actually translates to changes in your CTF. Um, let me go back to the program itself and I can show you. So this program actually has a, let's see. Yeah, over here. So this is the KV. So let's say we have 300 and now I go to 100. Let's see how it changes. It actually moves to the left, as you can see. So let's go back to 300 again. Right, left. So the absolute change, I um, I will you don't need to remember anything. But the point is that as you change your kV, there's actually a corresponding change of CTF. The CTF is not the same across different microscopes. So when you actually set your defocus, for example, on a screening microscope like F20 and T12, it's not the same defocus value as as you would get when you look at, for example, your Krios microscope at 300 kilo electron volts. There is a difference in the CTF function from from these two um, from these two um, microscope settings, and that is actually reflected in a in equation itself. Um, so a lot of anecdotal observation is that some people say, "Oh, I actually see my particles better with the screening microscope, with the same defocus. I put the exact same defocus. I make sure it's the same. I, I use CTF uh, fine to measure it, and it'll say. But then my particles look less contrasty on the crease, so." What happened to the grid? Did you mess up the grid for me? Um, the answer is actually no. There is actually a difference um, in contrast that we saw because the CTF actually changes. Um, so this is a nice grid um, kind of table from John Rubenstein from the NRI workshop in that you, to actually get the, uh, at different KVs, you were to get a kind of equivalent contrast, what kind of defocus value it needs to use. So for example, at 300 KV, to get kind of the same Con uh, contrast as you get 100, you need to go 1.8 times the defocus value. And, and vice versa, if you have uh, 300 kV emitted it and you just want to go to a screening microscope and, and see the particles kind of the same way, the same contrast, you just need about half the amount of defocus to get there. Yeah. So, it, um, so it's just something to really take, bear in mind that if you see our particles, you don't really uh, one thing that you don't really see our particles very well already on a screening microscope then yeah maybe there's no point to get a Krios uh, but also don't worry if you don't see your particles in the same contrast as you do in, on the Krios itself okay so TTF varies with the microscope voltage okay so now we have we kind of understand the different parameters of the CTF um, contrast function itself 
uh, we can move on to what kind of modulates this contrast transfer function. So in Grant's lecture, he talked about the envelope function in terms of having partial spatial coherence dampening it and partial temporal coherence um, dampening it. Um, there can be also other things in a microscope or doing from all the way from the imaging to actually the camera itself that can um, affect your envelope function and usually it just makes it worse. Um, such as um, you have a sample drift, you build up contaminants, you have something blocking away and even the, the microscope itself has an envelope function called modulation transfer function which Anchi will talk about and if you want to actually Grant Jensen mentioned about this um, later on in a single particle section on resolu resolution limitations so you can look at that if you want to understand it better um, but the whole idea is that all these things are a lot of them are a bit beyond your control if you go and image on your sample that's a microscope you get that's a condition you get um, your grid already, I mean, you can do a best your grid preparation, but it's inside, it's inside. Um, so the idea is to know that there is such an envelope function that degrades your high resolution signal, and, there are, and anything that helps you along the way will help you recover the higher spatial frequency information. Um, and as well from Grant's lecture, the idea is that you, um, the degradation affects the low spatial frequency information less as it does the high spatial frequency. Just think about it, if you, if you blur something, um, like you blur a building from afar, you, can't, you probably cannot make out the windows as clearly, but you can make out the gross structure of the, the building or the Empire State Building. But I can't see what, uh, how many windows there are, but I can see the shape of it. So that's just a basic idea of why an envelope function will blur, um, your, your, you'll lose your high spatial frequency information much earlier than your low spatial frequency ones. And then you can um, kind of model that by adding a kind of a temperature factor to the end of your CTF, um, like sometimes you're doing crystallography. Okay. So now I'll come to the kind of pros and cons of a high defocus. Um, the penalty of a high defocus, as remember we saw from the CTF fit, that you was use increase the defocus, you get a lot more oscillations and, uh, and the oscillations happen faster and faster at higher spatial frequencies. And what happens at these spatial frequencies is that actually when you image, you get, because of the envelope function and dampening, you get more noise, so it's harder to kind of um, estimate the signal there. And if you change, um, you go up and down so many times, you don't even, uh, and when you try to recover back the CTF and estimate it, you don't even know what is signal and what is not already, so it's even harder to know what is up and what is down. So um, it actually basically scrambles all your information you have at these high spatial frequencies. Um, so to reduce these kind of resolution dampening effects um, of a high defocus, um, collecting at focus of course will be ideal, then you have your, the most gentle um, CTF. Um, just know that at focus the CTF is not like flat or anything, there's still a, a CTF function. Um, the issue is that the samples cannot be seen when you are too close to focus. As we saw at like 0.5, you can hardly see it really. Um, conventional single particle analysis, we usually use like point, minus 0 0.5. If you're lucky, if ice is thin, you can see your particles to like minus 2.5 or even higher. Um, so imaging at focus actually can be possible um, if you can introduce some kind of phase contrast to the, the sample. This has been done a long time in like light microscopy, but only has been routinely done uh, in um, in cryo EM now using because of the advent of more robust phase plates. So here I'll quickly touch on um, the the phase plates we use now. I mean the like the old older version of phase plates are the Zerniki phase plates. I will not touch on them. I'll touch on the ones that if you image in like in our microscope center now, you'll be using. They are called the Volta phase plates. Um, what they are is actually a piece of carbon and then they, they have, don't have any holes on them. The old ones have actually holes on them to introduce the phase contrast. So these ones just are just a layer of carbon and where you put them, you put them here in your objective aperture. So instead of having an aperture to kind of cut out the, the, the rays, you, you put in a piece of carbon over here and the, the electrons will actually go through this piece of carbon and or effects I don't think anyone has kind of understood fully yet is that they will actually introduce a phase um, a, a phase shift um, in your image because of the, of the carbon. Yeah, so you just knowing a microscope, this is where this thing comes in, below your sample, the samples here. 
Yeah. And then if you go back to the CTF function itself, you can see where this thing actually comes in. So we actually put a phase contrast over here. So the phase contrast is actually the phase shift of the sorry, phase shift. The phase shift of the Volta phase plate is, is over here. And then what other parameters that affect it will be kind of the radius of the Volta phase plate spot, S. Um, so you don't have to understand it clearly, but the point is that um, the smaller the Volta phase plate spot, infinitely small spots are the best because this will um, become almost zero and then and then this will be co uh, close to infinity. So what you have is that when you have a phase shift, you can actually see your images better, which I'll show here. So this is a sickle particle proteasome um, from Rattle's, um paper. What you can see is that with this C here is when you image conventionally without a phase plate, you can see kind of clone rings, and but the particles are like what you will see usually. But once you add in a, a phase plate, you can the particles actually the contrast actually brings up much, it brings up the contrast quite a lot. So you can see the particles now are black, and it's really nice contrast as compared to not having a phase plate. And this can help you in uh, a lot of things from single particle imaging here. Sorry. So we're actually looking at tomograms because you can see the details. Yeah, these are actually just similar. Um, let's see, these are tomograms, so they are similar tomograms. Except this one, you can actually see more finer details uh, of the of the part of the cell. You can see all these things as compared to this one, thanks to the face plane. Okay, any questions? Okay, talking so much about the CTF, there is. Um, the kind of end of my section is that there are some times when the CTF doesn't apply. Um, if you remember Grant Jensen's kind of last lecture, he mentioned about how you go from Fourier transform the object, then you can get to the image, and there's the back focal plane. So if you go to the back focal plane itself, this is what happens when you have like the Fourier transform the image without the CTF. And if you image directly here, um, you will get a bunch of diffraction spots, which they use for in the case like micro ED. And in, in this case, the CTM actually doesn't apply. The, 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 to, the CTM actually defined as like the, the back over plane Fourier transform multiplied by the CTF, you get the image. So what um, it, it um, happens here is that, um, yeah, so the CTF doesn't apply the diffraction spot, so you don't have to worry about all the, the, um, the issues of the CTF if you are doing something like micro EV. Okay, thank you. And now we move on to Enchi. So my idea of this course is that you are supposed to, you know, listen to Grant's lecture and have questions. It's not working. How far do I have to go? Hmm. I don't know. I didn't do anything to it. Okay, it might be turned off. Technology is horrible. How did that come off? Hello? I can't hear. Even if I'm, it's right on. It's free now. Okay. Here very well. Yes. So what I want to cover is something that uh, in Grant's gen uh, in Grant's uh, uh, lecture hasn't talked about that much, and it's a bit of a advanced topic in terms of a Fourier transformation. But it's basically um, will bring everything that you learn about Fourier transform together, and then you, know, you can move on to this. You now there are places I will point you to. Um, uh, places that you can read about it. Once you start actually doing uh, Quail EM, 
and start reading literature, then it will start to make more sense that you will know where to look for you know, this basic term. So the term I want to talk about here, it's called the aliasing. In Grant's, gen in, in Grant's lecture, he talked about this, only touched this very, very little. So the thing that you see, what we call the aliasing, is um, um, basically effect that you're going to see in most of the, your, your detecting image which is what I'm showing here. So, do I go to the next? Okay, while I'm talk, trying to give you the definition of what this is and what it does, I want you to think about these two questions because I'm gonna ask you at the end, you know, what these are. Okay, so the first is that what conditions are needed to actually see the effect, okay? The second, is that if I have a given input, will I be able to reproduce aliasing every time? Okay, just by doing a Fourier transformation of, you know, I put it through my detector or whatever and do a Fourier transformation. Is it going to show up the same every time? Okay. Okay. Okay, so what is aliasing? So the way to think about aliasing in the most simple way is that let's say we want to do Fourier transformation. We want to describe uh, effect of adding two uh, sine wave. The first is at its fundamental frequency, and the second one is at the same, with the same amplitude, but at the first harmonic. So that's the probably the simplest addition that you will be adding the two. And then you can see that you now if I do Fourier transformation as is being shown at the bottom, then I will describe what I'm what I'm trying to do here with just two nine, two basically two values, each at the two different frequency, with an amplitude and a phase. Now if we describe the phase if we describe our Fourier transformation with a star with a cosine function, which um, Grant did in his lecture, then all of, both of this will have a 90 degree phase, right? So now I have something that with amplitude of one and uh, uh, phase shift of 90 degree at both terms. When we add these two things together, this is the kind of wave you actually get, okay? It doesn't look like neither one of them. Okay. Now let's say for some reason that we are limited by the way to describe it without the harmonic term. All I have is try have to describe what we observe in the real space with a Fourier space. I just lost something. And here again, maybe maybe the battery is. Yeah, okay. it's not good. Okay. Okay. Try to keep it still. I'll be back. Okay. So if we try to describe this particular particular wave with only one term, then what am I going to do? So you would basically intuitively you would say I'm going to fit this whole thing with one sine wave, right? So that's exactly when you do a Fourier transformation. Let's see, it's not me. So if I'm trying to fit it, this is what I'm going to get. Okay. This will have a different amplitude from what you had before, right? In other words, I didn't even been able to reproduce that one term. It's been modified because I have added another term, you know, in the making of this wave in the beginning. Okay, so this is the effect of aliasing because it doesn't look like what it was before, both in real, you know, in real space or Fourier space. Okay, so this is 
idiocy. You have a modification of what you can measure because of something that's outside your frequency cutoff. Because you have some signal that's outside your frequency cutoff that's contributing to what you are trying to describe. And uh, it couldn't describe it properly. So what it's going to do, it's going to try to take put that information in some other way that it can do within the range. So this is aliasing. Should we wait? Since we are keeping this on the web. Okay. All right. So, so this is what the ADS is. So in reality, in a real world example, let's say I have something that our Nyquist frequency as you know, described in, in James' lecture, the Nyquist frequency is the highest frequency that it can be, you can describe with your pixels detector, for example. You have a Nyquist frequency, and then you have signal that's going beyond, which is shown in this case no, we just have a monotonic decrease of my signal. So I have some more stuff that's outside Nyquist. But in reality, because the detector can only get you to Nyquist, so what is that information going to have to go? No, when I'm fitting and try to describe what is going on, what I have to do is pretty much if you normally see is that it's folding back. That's the picture that I show at the title slide. Okay, so this is an example of what it's looking at. What what's going to happen with the aliasing? That so in this particular picture, there is a very strong signal at a very high frequency part. So and that's more like a powder pattern. You at the same frequency that you have a ring overall, but the, the detector has its nine efficiency being cut off at some point slightly less than what it can cover everything. So what would it do? It would take the part that is supposed to show up properly in the ring, just fold it back. I just keep on pressing it every time. Press with the battery? Yeah. So you're gonna see inside of your image something that doesn't look right, which in fact is the, a direct, as you can see, a direct mirror of what it should be on the outside of the range that you, you can, can look at. Okay, all right. Now we have a uh, good battery. So this is like th this is aliasing, and uh, you're going to see this in your data. You're going to see this one. Somebody you know showing you imaging. You will see people have argument of how we should be collecting data and what's the theoretical value that you will get. It's a lot of it has to do with this: how much you can capture in the frequency domain to describe what's in the real real space and vice versa. You can have things that's the other way around. All right. All right, there's another kind of aliasing that Grant actually covered. He was talking about saying that in reality, when we are, we are, uh, we are reading the information of our Fourier things, we are actually doing it in a discrete way. The pixel, is picking up an integration of the values inside you know, that pixel. So its description of that wave is never perfect. Okay, So that's exactly what this slide is trying to show you. A certain frequencies that you can do very well, 
But if you go to higher frequency, as it is at the bottom, it can no longer describe it well. It doesn't give you the right right height. It doesn't give you the right frequency if you just look at what that pixel is. So that's another kind of um, um, aliasing that you know that's from discrete sampling and the, 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 the pixel. And as a result, that when you are uh, describing your perfect detector as the Nyquist, it doesn't be able to transmit all your information at the same amplitude, like that frequency there. So you can't get everything. Because if you look at this image, is that, that what it's saying is that, okay, now I have a frequency I need to describe here. But when I integrate it, I only get this high. Here I only get that high. I never get the height of this peak anymore. So my amplitude gets reduced. So there's there's a limitation just because of how we use it. There are things that that can't be changed. And that's no one's fault. It's not the 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 the, per, the it's not that the camera manufacturer cannot make it better. That's just the way it is. Okay, so now come back to these two questions. So what do you think? What's the first, the answer to the first one? Now you have to answer. Give me your thought. What do you learn? Anyone? So that when there's high frequency, at high spatial frequency, there's, there's data, but the detector basically is not getting it. And so it's, um, it's limited. Right. So number one, you need to have high inform. You need to have high, high higher inform, higher frequency. Contributing to the signal. Right, and that has to be a significant effect. If there isn't anything at a higher frequency, then what you can look at, then you will be fine. You don't see anything. Okay. So that's a very important condition for seeing the aliasing. Now, how about the second? We just how about we just take a vote. People who think that if I have something coming in, will it be reproducible, the effect of aliasing? Those who think that it would be not reproducible, raise your hand. Okay. Now, those who think that it would be reproducible. So what do the others think? <laughs> what, what, can you explain what you mean by reproducible? Uh, okay, so if I say I already start off with a wave coming in, and I'm going to ask that my detector, am I going to always be seeing the same result? If my detector doesn't change, in other words, my night bus doesn't change. So you're, st you're still limited by the detector yeah. itself? So if I do it once, will I get this, this result? If I do it another time, will it get another deal? In other words, what I'm trying to ask you is that, is this a mathematical effect? Or is this a something that contributes from the noise? So wouldn't that have to do with whether your Nyquist cutoff essentially can exclude um, high frequency information reliably or not. Whether, you know, the high frequency information can be sometimes perceived to a certain degree by your detector and others not. Is that, a, you know, is that an absolute, um, is there an absolute cutoff or is it more, you know, dependent on, you know, various conditions that you cannot necessarily control every single time. Yes, that's, uh, that's the part I'm asking. Yeah, so... I mean, theoretically, if you're, sam if you're sampling far below the frequency of the information image, then you're more likely to, when you look at the way you say. Right, but if I, I have a bigger frequency where I cut off, will this wave always end up giving the same aliasing effect? Your cutoff is absolute, yes. Yeah, if your cutoff is absolute at a certain point, then it should always come back in the same way. Yeah. 
Because remember, what the we did was just two sine waves, right? How am I going to, how, how I got it only for one sign. I'm going to fix with the exact equation every time. It will going to give me the same amplitude, the same phase every time, no matter what. So aliasing is actually a mathematical effect, okay? It's not because I got some noise and then it start doing something weird to my image. So that's something that you should, should, should realize. So that will happen every time. And that's because the Nyquist limit doesn't have noise, is that? Nyquist is that limit that just means where you, how far you can describe your information up to in frequency space. That's what the Nyquist limit is. How far you can go up. But that's determined by the detector, and the detector has noise. I think that's where I'm confused. Mm. Say it again? I mean, isn't the Nyquist limit determined by, fundamentally by the number of pixels in the detector? And so isn't it a function of the detector which would have noise? I think that's going back to what you said. Okay, so a detector, your Nyquist limit is determined by your pixel size. Right. Okay, it's not determined by the noise of that detector at all. Okay. Okay, it's a pure frequency question. This, uh, that's yeah, so it's always determining so what frequency, how far I can physically be able to sample, right? You can sample it to certain pointers. But all that, you can't describe your sine wave or cosine wave with that kind of pixel. Okay, so those are things that doesn't change. So you, in real space, so you look at the real space stuff, okay? I say I have a bigger detector. Does it actually change my Nyquist frequency? See, in terms of how many reciprocal answer, it doesn't change that. Okay, you may sample it more finely, right? Because your lowest frequency in your Fourier transformation is determined by the length of the you know, real space things. But the highest frequency part in your Fourier transformation is determined by the distance between your pixel. Okay, so this is Fourier transformation that you are looking at. It's always the opposite. One look at the large side and one look at the small side. So if your pixel size is the same, your line plus frequency is the same. Right? So there are all things like this. All right. All right, so now the last question. I was wondering about this as well. I'm, I'm not quite sure that I have the right answer, okay? Now we talk about information that are coming in with signals and all those things. And you have alias in fact that goes back in to the, your, your inside of the frequency space that you look at. What happened to the noise? Okay, say for example, I have a sharp, sharp noise or fine noise, which is flat all the way to the infinity. What happened to the aliasing of that? Where did that go? So I don't have a real answer for that, and I'm open for suggestion. So what do you think? So you have been, this is, you know, mathematically, it's still an information, something, right? Now, if I look at this, a detector that I'm only look at a lower frequency part, am I end up with all those piled back in, and then my noise keep on going higher and higher as I go to a, a lower frequency. Does it do that or not? Depends how much the noise is contributing over the signal. That's signal. one way to, to look at it. Now let's think about a pure noise. What would it do? I mean, it wouldn't be that, you know, you're really subtracting from your um, contrast calculation because you're picking uh, your particle and you're picking a background spot. If the white noise is constant through infinity, it would be part of the background that you're subtracting already. So it shouldn't come into the calculation to begin with. It's probably true. That's 
a good point. No matter how much that changes your characteristic of your, your game, that's very likely. As long as the noise doesn't, as, as was said earlier, you know, essentially preclude you from picking particles. Like if the noise is so high that you're unable to pick particles, then you know nothing. You know, you can't really do anything about that. But otherwise, it would it should be subtracted. to me. I'm very curious about what this really does. Okay. Now, with all those things, now we come back to talk about detector now. Okay. Once you start using a microscope, people are still saying, oh, you have to use this detector, you have to use that detector, you have to use the small uh, because it's MTF, it's better with this, because the DQE is better when you do it like that. All those things all come from, you know, your Fourier transformation. They describe everything about the detector in a Fourier space. Okay, they describe how a detector can uh, trans can transfer your signal out to the frequency. The end is always the Nyquist frequency. So they will they will talk about the MTF, which would be the envelope function that the detector imposed on your image. That's the idea. We talk about DQE. DQE is your NTF in some form and uh, divided by noise. So that will be a signal to noise ratio that you will get at each of this frequency. So that's one of these two things. DQE describes how good this detector is in a term of being able to 
give you info, a signal to noise ratio. NTF tells you whether you have an envelope function that's being bent at the bottom. Right. Can I ask something? Mm -hmm. I mean, very, I don't have a good understanding yet, but if the envelope function is essentially a mask function that your detector imposes, shouldn't that be a denominator as opposed to a numerator since it's actually going to dampen your signal uh, and not multiply it? But remember, it's going to dampen everything. Yeah. Anything that you see in there. Oh, including the noise. Yeah. So it dampens everybody. Okay. That's why they do this thing like this way. They try to describe how much you can get more on the signal. Because the noise also change as you go from the lower frequency and the higher frequency. So he wants to find out you know, what's the value. The noise is in general a lot of work for a lot of detector. The lower lower frequency is lower. The, their their noise is higher and higher frequency because there are many different kind of noise that can come from some electronic stuff. So, so that's why the two are different. Okay, so very soon you're going to see people talking about this paper. Okay, this paper described is trying to compare different detectors. Okay, and uh, at that time you have so many detectors, and so they try to plot the DQ and say, oh, who is the best? All I want you to concentrate on is this two. Okay, because this two relates it has something to do with AIDS. On the K2, the time K2 camera, which is the state of art of a camera right now, that you can find anyway. So that has two different modes, one called the counting mode and the other one called the super resolution. Okay. Basically what do they say is about the super resolution is to get away from this alias and pop. That's basically what the super resolution is. Okay, resolution, super resolution mode is to make sure that you don't get alias and pop pop. How do they do that? They make sure that it doesn't have any signal beyond that super resolution Nyquist frequency. Remember we said that what do you need to get alias and you have a signal that's beyond it. Now, by sampling it even finer than your actual pixel is, by some mathematical trick, that then you ensure that it will never be limited by it. So the mix is BQE higher. You see in here, the BQE for the super resolution can be a higher BQE. So that's basically what we just learned here. Okay? Why does it diminish the lower frequency information or efficiency? I, that I'm not all that sure. The lower resolution part of why is this the, you know, making a difference is there. I don't actually understand why. When we, when we talk about, you know, the information being brought back into that part, I think that there are there are different things that it is doing. You know, it's never really just that short of uh, a contribution. You know, it probably has other contributions, and for whatever reason, that at a really low resolution, it's stronger. Ooh. Yeah. So, and then the other thing you want to you want to think about the really carefully is that if people start talking about this, the values are. As well as what people can measure, it's very difficult to do. Okay, these measurements are really difficult to do, mainly because of the measurement of noise. The measurement of noise is really difficult to do. So the value there, the small differences there, I would be wor I would not be you know, worried too much. But uh, the reason people are talking about you know you should use this super resolution is because. ADS is a mathematical defect, defect that you know it's there. So you try to do what you can. That's basically what it is. Whether, you know, the lower resolution part, where is that coming from? 
That's a really good question. It shouldn't be there because you, know, you don't get high frequency information that far out to actually impact. So maybe their calculation wasn't quite right. Now if I correct that correctly for the counting model, I get my counting model actually look better. So it's a little tricky in terms of describing things. Okay. Well, that's an advanced Fourier transformation for you. So, reading, if you are interested in things like this, John's talk at the annual workshop is very good. It covers a lot more, and he talks about how different things, how different uh, companies uh, get rid of this alias in fact as well. And uh, you know, there are a lot more in that. Questions? No? Any other general questions from Brent's lecture for this two part? Then there's no reason you couldn't do it. The only minus on that is the end. 